All right. Hello, um, I'm David Sturman, a senior policy analyst with the Future Security Program here at New America. And we're about to start, um, so please take your seats. Um, thank you for coming to this event, uh, which is an event with New America's Future Security Program and Arizona State University's Future Security Initiative in partnership with the Army Strategist Association. Um, just a little bit of um, housekeeping for our people online and for you all. Uh, books are on sale in the at the registration desk or online via the button at the bottom right of your browser window. For those online, you'll be able to ask questions when it comes to Q&A by putting your question into the Slido box. And with that, thank you all again. And I will turn our event over to Dr. Ken Clayman, um, Professor of Practice at Arizona State University's Future Security Initiative and President of the Army Strategist Association. Thank you. Thanks, David. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for those who are joining us here in person and those who are joining us online. Um, I have the pleasure uh, to introduce to you somebody who many of you already know, but uh, Dr. Andrew Krepinevich, um, who he's certainly known to all Army strategists, but, uh, but also very well known. So I will be very brief with my uh, introduction uh, of you, sir. Um, Dr. Andrew Krepinevich, uh, I think, first came to fame for his wonderful book, The Army in Vietnam, which if you spent any time in professional military education, you read it. Um, but he's also written uh, several other books, including uh, the Seven Deadly Scenarios, one of my favorites, and uh, also one about Andrew Marshall, which I'll uh, also mention here briefly. But uh, Dr. Krepinevich um, spent a lot of time in the Office of Net Assessment, the uh, Department of Defense think tank where he actually worked for the great Andrew Marshall who um, most of us know uh, by his nickname Yoda which I think makes you a Padawan of, uh, of Andrew Marshall which is which is certainly a, a compliment mm. but uh, beyond that he's done uh, some amazing uh, work since then still uh, for the Office of Net Assessment but also for the uh, Hudson Institute fairly recently with uh, archipelagic defense but here our main topic tonight is about his uh, recent book which I'll call, still call it a recent book, but it actually came out one year ago today, and we didn't plan that. It just so, so happened. But uh, uh, the origins of victory. Um, and so we're going to talk, uh, uh, talk about that today. Um, most importantly, though, I, I do want to say uh, Dr. Krepinevich is, uh, we like to call him the godfather of Army strategy. Um, sorry we gave you that name, um, but... Uh, before the Army designated or had a career field, a functional area designated to strategy, uh, you were an Army strategist long before that was a thing. So um, uh, the book did come out a year ago, and you and I were talking about this book over two years ago. We're sitting in the open area of the Pentagon. Um, and I think we were talking with Ben Fernandez and you had mentioned the book and I said, we really need to do a book event with the Army Strategists Association. Um, things happen, time passed, but uh, you know, uh, you've done a few, you've been able to do a few events, but now finally we've been able to have this event. And I know that many Army strategists have already read the book. I read it once when it came out and then I read it again for this, uh, uh, for this event. But if you could, can you give us a brief synopsis of the, the three sections of the, uh, uh, of the book? Sure. So the, the book, <clears throat> part one, it makes the argument that uh, the U.S. military in particular, but the world in general, is in a period of disruptive change in the character of warfare. And uh, there are three, three big changes. One for us is the, what I would call the maturing of the precision warfare regime. So in the first Gulf War, you could argue we introduced precision warfare. Uh, what, the, what our Soviet adversaries at the time called a reconnaissance strike complex, okay? 
And basically, it has three components. One is sort of the scouting or the ISR, one is the strike, and one is uh, the C4, the battle network. And when we looked at the, I was working in net assessment at the time, we looked at <clears throat> what the Soviets were saying after that war before they collapsed. It was, this is what we've been talking about. So we had sort of the, the first early rudimentary version of the reconnaissance strike complex. At the time, we thought, well, this won't last long. Other militaries will catch up because uh, you know, we're onto a good thing here. It took over 20 years. Um, but that revolution, if you will, that occurred, uh, we found now that it's maturing. And my mentor, Andy Marshall, used to say, uh, it'll be, it'll, this, this precision warfare regime will be mature when somebody else has what we have. Uh, for those of us who are familiar with military terminology, it's when we no longer operate in relatively permissive environments, it's contested environments. And of course, the, <clears throat> the leader uh, in that, in terms of our, our rivals, uh, are the Chinese. So that's, uh, that's a very big adjustment. Uh, it's not just uh, innovation that we have to undertake uh, to deal with this particular situation, this change. It's disruptive innovation. And there's a lot of work in the business literature by people like Clayton Christensen, who differentiates between innovation, which is kind of you know, the air mobile division, and disruptive innovation, which is something like blitzkrieg, you know, where the whole thing changes and a huge boost in military effectiveness. So that's, that's the first problem. Second problem is, or change, <clears throat> is this overlapping, uh, emerging, we don't know what it's going to look like at the end of the day uh, revolution that is being driven by the broad advance of technologies. And we all see it just about every day. We go, what's going on with AI? What's going on with synthetic biology, quantum computing, robotics? Uh, additive manufacturing, directed energy. Um, <clears throat> so it's advancing on a broad front. We don't quite know just how it's, how it's, who's gonna gain the most advantage, who's gonna basically take this raw technology and transform it into military effectiveness. Uh, so that's the second. The third, which is not in the book, uh, is this transition from a bipolar to a tripolar uh, nuclear rivalry in terms of great nuclear powers. And I wrote a piece on that a couple of years ago in Foreign Affairs and just started to get into that more now. But so that's the first part of the book. First part is two big changes. Uh, you know, we, it's, it's not gonna be a matter of innovation. It's, it's, we're gonna have to engage in disruptive innovation, large scale innovation. And <clears throat> the, uh, provides a little bit of context to that. So it says, you know, these, uh, the, the rate of change began to accelerate with the Industrial Revolution. And up until that time, we fought in two domains, basically the land and the sea. There wasn't much you could do if you were on the land to influence what was going on at sea and vice versa. Well, <clears throat> middle of the 19th century, we move into the electromagnetic domain with, uh, with the telegraph, okay? Really improves military effectiveness. Uh, toward the end, we move into the undersea, early part of the 20th century, and, <clears throat> excuse me, into the air, okay? And uh, so we're moving into, into more domains. Um, what am I missing here? Um, in World War II, uh, we're basically operating in five domains. There's the air, the sea, the land, the undersea, and the electromagnetic. And since World War II, we've added three more by my taxonomy. We've added space, the seabed, and cyber. So not only that, but you have these increases, these rather dramatic increases in the, the range, the speed, uh, and the accuracy, uh, more recently, of, of weapons. So we can operate uh, over much greater ranges with much higher speeds. Uh, than we could say two centuries ago. And uh, with the precision revolution, far greater accuracy. And what this really enables is what I would call not multi-domain because we've been doing multi-domain for, but cross-domain warfare. And so when we think about the Chinese say, controlling the, the seas around Taiwan, uh, if they were doing it 200 years ago and it was the Royal Navy, you'd have a bunch of wooden ships. Now they can pull from all eight domains uh, to different degrees and in different ways to exercise sea control, which is really great because it gives you a lot of options. 
but it's really challenging because we've gone from playing you know, one or two dimensional chess to eight dimensional chess. So what is the optimum mix for any particular operational problem that you have for how are you going to address it? So um, looking at all that, uh, part two of the book says, well, if you buy the argument that you need to engage in disruptive innovation, what do we know about militaries that do it well? And so part two says, well, I, I really don't know. Um, and so I looked at four cases. Uh, I tried to look them in as, as great a detail as I could. In fact, most of the book is, is the part two. So one is the Royal Navy and the so-called Fisher or Dreadnought Revolution. One is the German military with Blitzkrieg. Uh, one is the American Navy, the transition from the battle line to the carrier task force. And what is the American Air Force going <clears throat> from, uh, from the sort of the World War II era into the era of precision warfare and stealth and PGMs and so on? And basically, and fortunately uh, for me writing the book, uh, there were some common characteristics. It would have been awfully disappointing if I got to part three, and, but there, there were, there were about, I don't know, eight or nine. And so part three talks about, well, um, these four militaries that led the way in exploiting a new way of warfare through disruptive innovation, they have these common characteristics. And there's a little, the editors at uh, Yale University Press said, well, you have to tell about, you know, say something about how the American military is doing. And it turns out that uh, we have a ways to go yet, um, looking at these metrics, these sort of indicators that uh, these four militaries exhibited. So that's, that's kind of the book in a nutshell. Uh, that's great. Um, reading some of the reviews of the book that have, that have come out, um, Lawrence Friedman actually reviewed the book and uh, gave it a very good review. And, uh, but I did notice that in it, he had a, a little bit of a, of a criticism or a caution. And he said that, uh, referring to, to, to you in your, in your book, his approach risks overstating technology as the driver of change. Perhaps wisely, he has not yet sought to incorporate lessons from the Russian war in Ukraine, although these might challenge some of his assumptions. Okay, so let's be unwise mm -hmm. for, um, for a minute. Sure. And, and let me, in, let's ask how you think the war in, in Ukraine and perhaps even, uh, even the war in, in Gaza uh, is challenging some of your assumptions. Um, but I also want to give you the opportunity to respond to that point that, you know, you might be overstating uh, technology as the driver of change. Good. Well, um, as you might have uh, observed, I'm pretty old. So I, uh, as a major in the 1980s, um, I had the good fortune of uh, being assigned to the Office of the Secretary of Defense as Secretary Weinberger's at the time, assistant for special projects. And so got to see how strategy was made at a very high level. And then worked to work at the, uh, the Office of Net Assessment before I retired. When I was at the Office of Net Assessment, uh, Mr. Marshall, we were, we were leading up to Desert Storm. And he said to me, I was the guy who was working on the military balance, the, it was the sort of the crown jewel. You looked at the central uh, European military balance, which was NATO Warsaw Pact. And he said, I'm taking you off that. I want you to look at what the, the Russians have been writing about uh, since the 70s and early 80s. They, they say that there's a military technical revolution coming. And this war is gonna give us some data. Uh, we didn't quite know what was gonna, uh, Little side, we were, I mean, we had people who were, you know, sort of modeling the war and, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 American casualties. I had a, one of my fellow officers, uh, Ned Cavanis, Colonel Cavanis, he, we had these bilaterals going with the, uh, the Indian Armed Forces. And so Cavanis is looking at this stuff, you know, we're worried. I mean, we were really worried. And uh, he went to talk to the Indians, and he said, you know, it's really, it's really going to be rough, you know, it's good, a lot of casualties. And he said the Indians practically laughed him out of the room. They said, you guys are going to wipe the floor up with these guys. Um, and, you know, Cavanis comes back, you know, they're crazy. Um, they were uh, right. Um, but anyway, um, 
we do, uh, the war happens, and we do this assessment of the military technical revolution, which is out there somewhere, you can find it. And uh, one of the interesting things that comes out of it is that um, technology, while an enabler, is not the be all and the end all. Uh, in fact, I wrote a piece in 1994 um, <clears throat> for uh, uh, the, uh, I think it was the National Interest. Is that it? Okay. Um, pretty sure. And it, it made the point that while technology may be an enabler, if you look at, for example, the period between the world wars, the mechanization, aviation, radar revolution, notice that the technology that underwrote that revolution was out in the commercial sector. It wasn't as though you had this proprietary technology, and that's what, you know, the, the, uh, Railroad rifle telegraph revolution of the mid 19th century, you know, railroad telegraph, commercial sector. Uh, the nuclear revolution was kind of special, uh, and I think everybody sort of sets that to the side. But if you're looking at where this revolution that might be occurring now, if you look at the technology that is in the, in the book, it talks about basically, except for, I guess, uh, hypersonics and some aspects of directed energy, a lot of this technology, uh, additive manufacturing, which goes by 3D printing, uh, the biosciences, um, quantum computing, so on down the line, it's, most of it is occurring out of the commercial sector. So the, um, the point I tried to make in that article and the point I tried to make in the book and in other venues is if you've got technology that's widely available and you think it's going to lead at some point to an enormous boost of military effectiveness, then the, the two key metrics, if you're a military, one is who figures out how to put this stuff together better than the other guy first, okay? Who figures out Blitzkrieg? Who figures out the fast carrier task force? Who figures out uh, long-range uh, gunnery and flotilla defense, which is what Fisher was working on. Who figures out the reconnaissance strike complex? And that, um, that has uh, a lot to do with what's mentioned in the second part of the book, which is, not, is it's about technology, but it's about organizations and innovation and how they figure this out. And then the second metric, you know, you want to figure it out first, but particularly now, because it's so complex, you're playing this eight-dimensional chess, okay? And the other guy may be asymmetric. He may not, you know, fight you the way that you're, you think about fighting him. It's gonna be a, the book argues, it's kind of dueling reconnaissance strike complexes, you know, us and the Chinese. But the Chinese have, as they would say, you know, reconnaissance strike complex with Chinese characteristics. It's not the same as ours. And so, and, and neither of us are going to get it perfectly right, even if one has an advantage over the other. So the second key issue is, when we, if and when we go to war, we're going to figure out, you know, this, this is not working, this is working, and so on. Who can adapt faster to fix the problems that, that are revealed in the, the crucible of war? So I, I thought Larry Friedman's point there was a little, you know, certainly you don't want to overemphasize technology. And in fact, uh, Mr. Marshall, when we were finishing up the second version of the military technical revolution, he found that when I would go out and present it to folks that uh, they, were, they were calling it the military technology revolution. And that really ticked it off. So the Russians were using another phrase, revolution in military affairs. Marshall said, well, that's what we're gonna call it now. <laughs> okay, so that, that's, uh, uh, that's the first part. The second part about Ukraine is, um, you know, it's, it's, I could say it's too to, to tell, uh, um, but uh, just a couple of observations. One is, is the book really talks about warfare at, at a high level. And I would argue that this, if you, if you want to say World War II, you know, the, the Germans and the French, the Germans and the Russians, we and the Japanese, um, this is not that. This is more like the Spanish Civil War. Um, it's, uh, you, the Ukrainians do not have a reconnaissance strike complex. Uh, the Russians, if they do, uh, can't seem to execute it very well. I think there are some interesting aspects of what's going on in the war. One is it, it really brings home uh, what Sir Michael Howard uh, in his famous 1979 Foreign Affairs article calls 
Uh, the forgotten dimension is a strategy, the social dimension. What if Zelensky had fled the country? What if Ukrainians hadn't rallied uh, to the flag? Uh, it, it, to me, that's, uh, what if it's, you know, Lord Halifax and not Winston Churchill in 1940? Now, what if it's Alf Landon and not Franklin Roosevelt in 1940? So people, uh, leaders really do matter. Um, second is uh, there's a lot of uh, drone stuff, you know, a lot of writing about drones and I'm following it, you know, you, you get to find out stuff. Um, when I was chairing the CONO executive panel, we actually had a fellow, Brand Farron, who uh, runs Applied Minds. Uh, he also was, early on, he was head of Disney Imagineering, so a really fascinating guy. And he would keep, you know, every meeting, you know, you had to give Brand 15 minutes, he was talking about drone swarms. And that, for him, that was one of the next big things. And it's, I talk about it a bit in the book, and it, it might be a big thing. Uh, I'm not quite sure we have a sort of a definitive um, result, sort of a, uh, you know, a, a blitzkrieg event, uh, you know, France gets defeated in six weeks and you know there's something very new and different going on here. Um, one of the things we ran into in the discussion on the CNO executive panel was you have these trade-offs with drones. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the small drones, the quadcopters and so on, um, if you want to, you have to trade off between range and, and payload. Uh, the more fuel you put on, the more range, but the less payload you could have. Um, okay, well, if I have less payload, you know, of course, if I want to make the drone lighter, then can I use it in all kinds of weather, you know, all these issues. And um, you find out, you know, there's some interesting stories coming out. You know, they have drones now with, uh, with AI, drones with re that are remotely piloted, and they see this guy, and they, you know, the drone goes and kills the guy outside the tank. Um, and some really fascinating things going on. Um, I'm just not sure that, you know, this is a game changer. Um, again, I, to me, it's, it's too soon to tell. Um, so, uh, and people are saying, well, you know, it, this is more like World War I. Well, it, a lot of it depends on the military balance and how you plan the fight and these sorts of things. Um, but yeah, in, in some ways it is a lot like World War I because it's very static warfare. It's, it's a war of attrition. And, uh, you know, one of the issues that comes to my mind is you're going to have to find a way to, as the Germans did after World War I, how do you in, reintroduce mobility on the battlefield? Uh, and, um, you know, they found out how to do it. And again, uh, it was a metrics thing to some extent. Um, they looked at tanks, so I would argue significantly different than the, Ger uh, than the French did. So if you think you're replaying World War I, you want tanks that emphasize armor and armament. You want a tank that can take a hit and, you know, add to the artillery firepower. If you want to fight Blitzkrieg, you want tanks with speed and range because your stormtroopers and the tanks are going to break through. But you have to be able to get deep uh, and, uh, and quickly before the adversary can reform the trench line. So even with common systems, and you think about that today, you know, our drones, their drones, and so on. Uh, our hypersonics, their hyper, what, what, uh, what trade-offs are we going to make? The British carriers emphasized uh, armor plate and guns for defense. Our carriers had wooden decks and they emphasized getting as many planes on the carrier as possible because they said the best defense is a good offense. Plus they were fighting in the Med and we were fighting the Pacific, which makes a big difference. So, um, you know, uh, I was glad uh, Friedman wrote a, a good uh, review um, and we would have an interesting discussion if we were able to get together and have dinner. <laughs> Fantastic. I will say that the the case studies are rich, and in each of the case studies, there is a a conflict, uh, a smaller conflict, where a lot of learning takes place and uh, and deliberate learning. So I think that's yeah. one of the um, one today. I uh, you know sometimes I run into people and they oh we're already doing that, um, and uh, one one indicator if you're really doing disruptive innovation, is there's gonna be blood on the floor, okay? Uh, when Fisher tried to engage in disruptive innovation with the Royal Navy, which it was, fin he had something called the scheme, and there were all, everything from education to communications uh, to 
operational. And there was something called the syndicate of discontent that formed against him. Admirals, politicians, people in the press. And it got so nasty, it was headed by this uh, his fellow admiral, uh, Admiral Beresford, that there was actually hearings in the Committee of Imperial Defense that were um, asked with, the Prime Minister was, was basically chairing them, where Beresford and Fisher were having it out. And it basically destroyed both their careers. Um, they said von Secht, uh, the sort of one of the architects of, of Blitzkrieg, uh, junior officer said, this guy's crazy. This guy's nuts. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, same thing. Um, with the uh, with carriers, uh, there was something called the Gun Club, the battleship admirals, and uh, Admiral Moffat, who was uh, head of the Bureau of uh, Air Aeronautics uh, in the Navy, uh, Bureau Air, um, had to basically do all sorts. And yeah, these the guys who succeed in these histories actually engage in some shenanigans to actually advance the ball. So there's a whole whole soap opera going on, you know, behind the scenes as these people, and it, it happens out in the business world too. Uh, there's a great piece by Michael Cotter uh, in uh, an issue of um, Harvard Business Review that talks about why transformation efforts fail, why these big attempts at innovation. So uh, not only do you have to have the good idea, not only do you have to have the resources and the political support, but you also have to fight the political opposition. And uh, so when somebody says to me, well, the American military, we're, you know, we're, we're moving out. If you were moving out, uh, and, well, the one example I can give you is the Marines, because there, there is kind of a knife fight going on in the Marine Corps right now, uh, or Force Design 2030. And uh, whether you like it or you don't like it, you at least know the Marines are trying to do something right now. So. Uh, I, that gets us kind of to today. So I, I actually want to. Um... I'm going to turn to a page in the book. It's actually the last page uh, because I think it's, uh, it, it's pretty strong in the way that it's phrased. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to read you the last paragraph of, of the book. So finally, we have a preliminary assessment of the U.S. military's efforts at disruptive innovation. It finds that from the revolution in military affairs and efforts at transformation in the decade following the Soviet Union's collapse to the rise and fall of Joint Forces Command, uh, to the repeated attempts to develop operational concepts over the past decade, the United States Armed Forces exhibit few, if any, of the characteristics of military organizations that succeed in this endeavor. Okay, so that's that's kind of a harsh uh, indictment. I mean, and so, but I'm an optimist, and this book came out a year ago, and so I'm kind of interested to know, um, have you seen any encouraging signs that lead you to think that the U.S. is on a path, or at least promising small paths, to uh, correct some of these errors, for example, are we any closer to identifying that key challenge? Um, have we uh, clarified the problem in the joint warfighting concept? And clarification and joint warfighting concept going together is, you know. Um, have we resourced testing and evaluation? Have we solved this issue of the turnover of key leaders? I mean, these are some of the items that you found were key mm -hmm. in, in seizing these opportunities right. in disruptive innovation. Have we gone backwards? Are we getting better? Um, I would say we're getting better, but not fast enough, not anywhere near fast enough. So uh, I mentioned, you know, some indicators, some common indicators of these four militaries. And um, <clears throat> I'll mention, uh, I guess there's about eight or nine. I'll mention a couple and just give you an example because they, they kind of stand out in my mind. One is uh, extended tenure. You know, basically, you're, you're talking about an effort that's going to take probably 10, 12 years to bring about. Uh, and we give most of our senior commanders two, three years. Um, I was involved in creating Joint Forces Command when I was served on the, the National Defense Paddle back in 1997, and then served on its advisory board until it went belly up, which I recommended along with a couple of others, um, because it wasn't doing what we hoped it would. Uh, so you give uh, a, a senior general, uh, say the person heading Joint Forces Command, this job, but you don't give him enough time to do it. And when we're getting close to shut, so I'll give you an example. Fisher is 
number two in the Royal Navy, that he's head of the Royal Navy for six years. He leaves for a couple of years after the bloodbath with Beresford, and then they bring him back. Von Secht is head of the, uh, the shadow, uh, the, the Trepanov to the shadow German general staff for, I think, six years. Uh, Moffat's head of the Bureau of Aeronautics for 12 years. The only reason he leaves is he dies in, a, in a, uh, an airship crash. Uh, you know, there's Rick over, um, which is not one of the case studies, but holy cow. Um, and then there is uh, General Creech, who I had never heard of before I sat. He was head of TAC from 1978 to 1984, and he actually gets uh, the Air Force reoriented in a way that helps it win Desert Storm. Um, when Mattis was getting ready to shut down um, Joint Forces Command, we had this, he asked me to come down and spend a couple of weeks, and so I did, and uh, you know, one of the things I said is, if, if, if we really did this right, I said, you would have a, a person come in, they would run GIFCOM for three years. And if we thought that they were on to something, we'd give them another three-year tour. That's six years. And then, you know, if progress is still being made, we'd fleet him up to be vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs for four years. That would be the 10-year run. The Navy has something, um, in fact, is one of his key deputies at the time, John Richardson, um, head of naval reactors. I think the, the tour is six or seven years long. You can't do some of this stuff. And so what you do is you tell a, a guy or a gal, you know, you have two or three years, and you sort of bend the whole, you know, effort uh, into what can I get done in a couple of years. And it just, at least, and the, of course, what you also want, even if a person is not going to be around for 10 or 12 years, you give that person time to institutionalize. So Fisher had something called the fish pond, uh, which were his acolytes. And he was very good at placing them in key positions. Um, at General Creech, American Air Force, same thing. Moffat made sure that they changed uh, the personnel um, system so that if you were going to command a naval, air, yeah, a naval air station or a carrier, you had to be a naval aviator. So he would create command slots, paths to admiral for these people. Uh, that's a big part of the effort. So I, don't, I just don't see that right now. And when I was chairman of the CONO executive panel, we really tried to resurrect, I was calling it, they had something called strategic studies group that Watkins set up in the 80s to do strategic planning. And you got some really you know, good people in there. They became admirals, they became you know, leaders of the service. They, they kind of lost their way, uh, they were disbanded, but creating something like the strategic planning group uh, resurrecting that up in Newport, uh, and things like that for the other services, I think would be a good thing. So that's one. Another is, um, how are you going to find out how you can bring all these elements, you know, how you wage cross-domain warfare across eight domains with all these different capabilities? And um, the, way I, the way it's done in the book is, uh, or the way I um, I guess I realized how it was being done by these four militaries was something I called a virtuous cycle. So you would do an somebody would have a vision, you know, this, this is the next big thing, okay? They would do analysis, then they'd do a war gaming, and then they do, would do uh, exercises, but they, they would do these exercises not at the tactical level, they would do it at the operational level. And then they would feed, you know, it was, it was a constant feedback loop over and over. Uh, the, the American Navy is the poster child for this. Um, between the two world wars, they ran something like 130 war games on War Plan Orange uh, at the Naval War College. They ran fleet problems every year where they, they took most of the fleet out of the Pacific and the fleet fought the, ple the fleet. Some of these ran from Alaska down to Hawaii and to the West Coast. I mean, that's, that's the area they were conducting these exercises. And they were finding out what worked and what didn't work. And they were building momentum for change because these officers who were out there doing these things, they would see what was working. And you couldn't unsee it. Um, the big example with the Germans was in 1937, first time they used a, a panzer division and the North German plane exercises. The pl panzer division was tearing up the whole exercise. They had to shut down a two-week exercise after three days. And General uh, Beck, uh, who was head of the, uh, uh, the German general staff, 
uh, had a mini fit. Uh, you know, he, uh, but again, you can't, uh, you can't unsee what these people were seeing. And so to me, that's the way you find out faster and better than your, your adversary, what's going to work. Um, so that was, that was another issue. Uh, so these, and I, again, I, I've been campaigning for a, um, a combined trading center. In fact, uh, about 20 years ago, I talked to Hugh White. He was then uh, basically our USDP uh, for the Aussies. And I said, this is, you know, and he, I said, we need something big where we can, you know, radiate, you know, because a lot of this is going to be, you know, jamming and, and counter jamming and so on and trying to break up the battle networks. And I said, Australia, that's, that's what I want. I want Australia. And he said, well, we have, you know, big parts of the country that are basically empty. He said, the only reason you don't have that kind of a center in Australia is because you haven't asked for one. Now, I don't know, you know, 25 years ago is a long time. Actually, it's longer than 25 years. But the point is, uh, and I think this is what Admiral Harris was, uh, he, I've had some conversations with him when he was, um, um, in fact, then I guess, that was, no, was PACOM, uh, wasn't SyncFAC. Um, yeah, that's what we need to do. We need to find out. Now, one of the problems you're going to run into, one of the problems we ran into at Joint Forces Command, is when you do something like that, if you are engaged in disruptive innovation, if you think that things are really going to change big time, you're going to create among and within the services some big winners and losers. And the losers tend to see things, I, I would think, uh, more, that's where you get the syndicate of discontent. You know, that's where you get uh, the, the fighter mafia you know, and so on. Um, that's where you get the gun club. So. That's, that's, I think, one of the key reasons why we have not seen this kind of, of capability created. Um, and then, uh, the, and I'll, I'll shut up, um, but if you look at the administration's budget that's just come out, uh, and if you look at our strategy that goes back, I think, the NDSS uh, 2017 or 2018, um, we're only going to fight one big war. Well, you know, think about World War II. We fought two big wars in World War II, but there was no patent third army out in the Pacific. There was no, you know, task force 5838 in the Atlantic, you know, with Halsey and, and Spruance running it. You know, a war with Russia is very different than a war with China. And you can't just say, well, you know, we'll go here and we'll go there. Well, no, you're, you're gonna be, you know, unless you wanna be suboptimal for both. So unless you're going to actually spend the money that we need, and which we could if we got our fiscal act together, you're going to have to make a choice. And I came up with four metrics, you know, Russia, China, Russia, China. And the metrics are who has the greatest military potential over the next 20 years? Because if we go to war today, you know, we go to war today. So we have to think about what we're planning. And it's clearly China. I mean, China's economy is just ginormous compared to Russia They're in so many other ways. So that's one. Two, where do we have strategic depth? Well, we have it in Europe. We don't really have it. You know, first island chain, some of that stuff goes, it's gonna be awfully hard to get it back, okay? So those two for China. Third is, do we have a, a great power uh, uh, ally that's on the front lines? Well, we don't in Europe, but we do in Asia. We have Japan, arguably Korea, maybe even Taiwan with their chippies, you know? Um, so again, it's, it's China. And fourth is, you know, if, if there were no United States, who would stand a better chance of defending themselves? And it's the Euros. Uh, the Euros have a much bigger population. They have great technology. They're, Britain, France, Germany, and Italy all have GDPs bigger than Russia's. So you know, whether, you know, we try to coddle them, we try to encourage them, we try to beat on them. Um, you know, no matter what we do, the euros don't seem to be stepping up. And in the past, uh, we could kind of get away with that, but we can't do that now. So if it's China, uh, then we have to begin to focus on that. But we can't have a joint operating concept that's got to fit everything, because you're not going to fight in the Pacific the way you fight in Europe, let alone the Middle East. I'm going to steal one more question, and then we're going to go to the, uh, the audience. And I have to ask it because in the book, you talk about, um, you know, one of the, 
one of the great things to have is a little bit of serendipity, so a little bit of luck. Um, and then, of course, you also talk about the difference between a first mover advantage and a second mover advantage. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious because, uh, you know, when, when I was in uh, into PACOM with, with Admiral Harris, we had a lot of concerns about the INF Treaty and what it was doing to us. And I can't help but think, you know, the INF Treaty provided China with a little bit of serendipity uh, because, uh, you know, th they had were able to have a first mover advantage on hypersonics and uh, longer range precision, uh, uh, precision munitions. Um, but, you know, is there... Uh, do you agree that that, that happened, and is, do, do we gain any second mover advantage from you know what in in mine and others' opinion we may have lost about ten years in in uh, development? Well, so far we haven't lost anything. Um, so one of the things that you um, you look for in developing strategy are symmetries um, or advantages, okay, and how important are they? And so, but it, it goes back into well. What are you trying to do? You know, are you trying to defend the first island chain or are you trying to defend Europe? Okay. Uh, second, how do you think you're going to do it? Um, and uh, in, uh, in fact, I brought a couple of copies. Uh, the operational concept. So this is Archipelagic Defense 2.0. And it says, uh, this is how we're going to defend the Western Pacific. This is sort of uh, air land battle for the Western Pacific. Okay. For those of you who remember the Cold War, which I'm looking out there and I'm saying probably not too many. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, uh, what, you know, what do these missiles give you? Well, they give you prompt um, targeting over great ranges, uh, you know, very fast. Um, maybe you wouldn't need them if you had hypersonics, but there's a lot of issues to be worked out with hypersonics. Um, I don't like the fact that the Chinese have them and we don't um, because if, I have INF missiles, and the Chinese know that I could hit targets uh, over great distances very quickly, then they have to uh, take that into account in their planning. They either say we're going to, you know, these critical targets, whether it's command posts or air bases or what have you, we're going to have to disperse some of the stuff, we're going to have to harden it, um, we're going to have to do something, make it mobile. Uh, but I'd rather have the Chinese doing those sorts of things than building more missiles to strike me or building more submarines and so on. So, you know, to me, uh, these missiles that they have are driving us to do things that, you know, we don't want to do, and they're costing us more to offset uh, than it is for the Chinese to create this problem for us. A uh, problem we have with INF missiles right now is uh, we pulled out of the treaty because the Russians were cheating according to the Obama administration, and then the Trump administration pulled out. But um, we don't seem to have any interest in, in, uh, in fielding this kind of capability. And of course, part of that might be because you'd have to base them forward. You know, they, they, they're not ICBMs. And so the question then becomes, who will take them? And I can tell you, I talked to uh, Abe's uh, former, well, he's a former prime minister, was, um, his uh, deputy national security advisor last week, and you know they they're thinking about these sorts of things uh, for themselves, so they see uh, an advantage in this. And um, again, but they're so that I, I wouldn't call that necessarily serendipity. Excuse me, serendipity is something like in the book. So, has anybody ever heard of a, a, a flying deck cruiser? Yeah, the Navy wanted to build a flying deck cruiser in the early 1930s. It was arms control limited what we could do. 175,000 tons of aircraft carrier. That's how much you could have with the Washington, Washington Naval Treaty. Right? Washington Naval Treaty, right. So uh, Moffat, who's head of the Bureau of Air, he's scheming. He's an incredible schemer. Uh, he, you know, him, guys like him and Rick Over and Fisher. And so how can I get more air power out to sea? And so they come up with this idea of building, taking a ship that's building to be a cruiser and making it a cruiser on the front end and having a flight deck on the back end. And they're going to build, I don't know, five of these things. And um, the depression hits. And so oh, we're not going to build these things. And you, know, you, you could have, I suppose you could have sat there and said, Okay, well, you know, these 
these, you know, the, remember, oh, you don't remember the King Kong movie. Goodness, if you don't remember the Cold War. <laughs> anyway, there are these biplanes, you know, eh, you know, and they could take off with just about anything. You know, get to take off in this room. Um, but aviation technology was going like this. And so, you know, planes were getting bigger, you know, engines were getting bigger, you know, and so they needed longer runways. They needed longer carrier decks uh, to be able to launch these things. And so these things were horrible. Uh, if you would have built them, you just would have wasted your money. Same thing with the, uh, the carrier ranger. The carrier ranger was going to be the first um, design from the keel up aircraft carrier, okay? It was going to be 14,000, around 14,000 tons. We had these two mistakes, uh, Saratoga and Lexington. They were converted cruisers. You could convert cruisers under the treaty. There were something like 33,000 tons. These were too big. The Ranger, you know, was 14,000 tons. We could build a lot of, a lot of Rangers to get up to 175,000 tons. And that's what um, Moffat wanted to do. He wanted to build five Rangers. He was not particularly happy with the Saratoga and Lexington. Well, you go to World War II, and who do you read about these days? You know, read Ian Toll. Well, it's all about Saratoga and Lexington. The Rangers, off in the Atlantic, you know, because it's too small. You know, you need long runways for these big planes. You need big carriers because you want big air wings. You want 100 planes. And one of the things that's interesting about early on in World War II is when you get radar and radio, you get long-range radio, long-range radar, what starts out at Midway is offense dominant, I got to find the other carrier before he finds me, to the combined operations center, we can see them coming a long way away. And so the whole air wing changes. It changes from, being, from emphasizing attack aircraft to a much greater emphasis on fighter interceptors because you know when they're coming. And so that was, again, you, you, you run into these lucky uh, sort of, geez, you know, we could have had a lot of flying deck cruisers and rangers. That wouldn't have been very good for us. So there's, there's serendipity. Uh, there's serendipity, you know, the, the Germans had to choose between von Zecht, who was Mr. Blitzkrieg, and this guy Reinhardt, who said, we got to figure out how to fight World War I better. Well, you know, somebody made the choice. Uh, for, you know, for the Germans and Hitler, uh, it was good that they made it for von Zecht. So uh, again, um, luck, you know, there, there's a certain amount of, of luck involved. So we're going to go to questions. So for those of us joining online, uh, you should have the Slido app. So you want to use that for your questions and we'll make sure to take uh, the, at least one question from uh, online. But let's start with uh, folks in the room um, for questions. Please. Oh, uh, use the microphone because uh, for folks online, so they'll be able to hear you. Um, sir, when we talk about the origins of victory and you know all of these inputs that come to that over time, um, one thing that I've wondered about recently, and some people are writing about it, is like a, a lack of imagination when we think about you know what could happen. Like we've just like one example is the 9/11 report. Like it wasn't the lack of capability that we necessarily had. It was our lack of imagination that didn't allow us to think that terrorists could hijack planes and attack our, our, our mm -hmm. cities. Where do you see lack of imagination playing out now? And is there anything that we can do to, to zap us into thinking more imaginatively you know, at the strategic level to maybe get after some of these things and, and push some limits a little bit? Well. Um... The scenarios book has actually held up pretty well, and um, there were some. Um, they actually talked about a, a pand the, the book was published in 2009. It talks about a pandemic, uh, and uh, talks about problems at the border. Um, so anyway, um, I would say you have to have um, you have to have the right kind of thinkers. There, there's people who are particularly good at that. There's a, a book by a Nobel Prize winner named Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. It talks about the difference, you know, thinking fast, those are the fighter pilots, you know, bah, 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 I gotta make decisions real fast. Thinking slow, you know, more like people like me, very slow, very reflective, you know. Uh, the slow thinkers typically come up with this stuff. Um, maybe they have more time to smoke weed or something, I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, it's, um, 
it is interesting when we ran, so archaeologic defense comes out of the 2014 summer study. And um, so th this may help a little bit. Uh, so OSD, so let me re, uh, in 2008, I'm, I'm running uh, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. And we do, with RAND, we do a, um, a PAC-AF uh, uh, game out in Hawaii. And we're just starting to look at the Chinese because it's sponsored partly by Mr. Marshall in that assessment. And Bob Work comes back. He was working with us at the time. Um, and Bob said, we need something like air land battle for the Western Pacific. And again, I'm, okay, this is the, how we were going to fight the Cold War in Europe. And um, so we, we did something called air sea battle. And uh, the Pentagon picked it up. Uh, they had an air sea battle office and so on. And uh, so, uh, but you know, one question I had was, well, why didn't the Pentagon think of this? You know, why, why aren't these really bright military officers? So that was, was one issue. But uh, by 2014, this is about five years later, the air sea battle office has been folded into the joint staff you know, mega you know, joint Battlestar Galactica operational concept. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, I, I'm gonna, there's a great short story um, called Complexity. And uh, it is by um, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, the 2001 guy. It's, uh, you can probably find it online. It was written in the early 50s, but anyway, uh, I just uh, commend that to you if you have time. It's about technology and its uses and its misuses. Uh, um, but in, by 2014, OSD policy said, well, you know, we have the, the Air Force and the Navy talking about how they would fight in the Western Pacific. Why not the Army? Where's the Marines? And the Army's doing stuff like, well, the Army's a strategic force and strategic land power, and everybody's got an Army, but not everybody's got a Navy. And it doesn't, you know, so they, well, tell us how you're going to fight in the Western Pacific. Um, and so we ran this summer study, and we, we resurrected kind of the color plans that we had prior to World War II. We said, okay, Plan Orange is how we're going to defend Taiwan against a, a blockade. Uh, plan green is we, we lose Taiwan, we're going to use the Philippines as a staging area for a counteroffensive. Uh, plan blue is how are we going to blockade China? And so, you know, we were looking at these. So what happens if, um, if a war starts in Korea and we start funneling forces into Korea, but the real attack is coming in the, you know, in the South China Sea? And so we're looking at these sorts of things. And, um, no, you know, I don't, there's no monopoly on you know, thinking about this stuff, if you looked at um, the Cold War, so I'm working for Weinberger and Carlucci, you know, back in the day, and Cheney, when they were defense secretary, and we had, um, we had three different mobilization plans for Europe, okay? Um, we had, um, you know, the big war, we had one called the Hamburg Grab. Anybody know what the Hamburg Grab is? It's not, you know, you go down to, you know, Hardee's and, um, it, never mind. Uh, <laughs> so it was, uh, what if the Soviets, the Hamburg was, uh, anybody know how far, ha oh, you, oh, you know, how, how far is it? From, from the inner German border. It's not, far. it's not far at all. So it was, you know, the, the, the Soviets are just gonna, you know, put a bunch of tanks together, race across, grab Hamburg, and say, let's negotiate. And, uh, you know, you're, do you want to go to nuclear war? You want to risk that? Oh, the Euros, no, no, we don't. So, you know, the idea was, how are we going to stop them from doing that? Because if, if they do that, you know, does that fracture the alliance? Another one was um, they, we, they had the Soviet forces in Hungary. And we thought they were going to go south. But what, they said, well, you know, they could go through Austria, up, you know, up, up the chute there. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Um, so there, you know, so there, were, there was a whole range of contingencies that were being looked at. Um, I went and was talking to some Navy admirals recently, and this is a, another thing. Um, be glad to get some feedback from the audience. So there was something, and this, this wasn't secret stuff. This was appearing in what we call the posture statement back then. So it was 2-4, 10-14, 21-30. And 2-4 was 
We get two days warning, the war starts on day four. We get 10 days warning, the, day, the war starts on day 14. We get 21 days warning, the war starts on day 30. Uh, so that we would look at, you know, in terms of the mobilization buildup, where bumps were occurring, you know, where they would suddenly get an, an advantage, you know, a big advantage, and that would be the point where we need to either hammer it down or they would have an incentive to go to war at that point in the mobilization process. And that's where the Army got POMCAS. Anybody know what POMCAS is? What's POMCAS? Uh, old version of our, our Army preposition sets. Yeah, it's preposition overseas material conf configured in unit sets. <laughs> so we had about four or five divisions of just equipment. Uh, as uh, I was in, stationed at, uh, in Texas, and they said, go check out our equipment in Germany. And you go to Germany, and there it is. You know, the Germans, very neat, very clean. There was all set to go. Um, but we, so just fly the troops in. Uh, and that, so, and there's uh, one thing I would say positive. It, it seems to me that General Flynn uh, is doing uh, about as good a job as he can given. Um, so they're, you know, trying to preposition stuff forward, uh, for example. You know, the, the Pompkiss of the 21st, uh, Westpac Pompkiss or something. Um, but again, here's a, a commander that's got a couple of years. And if he has a vision, um, you know, can he transmit it uh, to enough people? Um, and you know, one of the things I always experienced uh, with commanders in the in the army when I was in is, well, if you know, if Krepinevich made his mark doing this, I'm going to make my mark doing that. <laughs> He's already done this. So um, again, uh, it, it's going to take some serious leadership from the top um, to uh, to make some track, get some traction here. Uh, Sorry for going on for so long. No, that's uh, that's great. If you if you want to make uh, General Flynn's a good friend of the association, and mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to make him go high and right, tell him that uh, ask him about Indo-PACOM being a maritime theater. And, and anyway, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> I, I emphasize it, it well, is absolutely a joint theater because of uh, well, all that has to go on there. And uh, when we did so, this came out of the the summer study that year, and the question was, go tell us, uh, you know, what what can the army do? What we have, so we said, well, what's the Army's competitive? Well, ground forces, deep magazines. Uh, you can harden ground forces ways you can harden maritime and air forces. Uh, you, know, so the, you can harden their communications. Uh, you know, they, if the satellites go out, they're not as screwed as, as you know, the other components and so on. And so you begin to look at that, and you find that, um, and Secretary Hagel, I don't think, Bob Work really pushed this, but Secretary Hagel, I don't think, really grasped it as, as well as he might have. We said um, air defense, Army. Um, we said uh, missile defense, mm -hmm. coastal defense, which was anti-ship cruise missiles. And I went over to Japan, and they, they were working on that. Um, when I came out with this, it was, OK, so if, if, the, if the Chinese say they have to control the air, and the sea and the information domains to invade, to you know, conduct an offense, uh, then we have to deny them that, right? Uh, the question is, how are they planning on doing it and so on? But the Army can play a big role in that. Mm -hmm. Another issue, uh, which I came up with this, is, uh, OK, so suppose the, the Chinese get ashore. Then um, how, how are you going to you know, basically try and slow them down? And I came up in this version with, I called it uh, turtle defenses and uh, uh, GRAM irregulars. So turtle defenses come from uh, reading Ian Toll's trilogy of the Pacific War. And there was, when they invaded Iwo Jima, one Marine captain reported to his superior that the Japanese were not on Iwo Jima, they were in Iwo Jima. <laughs> Basically, they had buried themselves and we had, we had total control of the air, total control of the sea, and it took us months to get those guys out. And OK, so you know, maybe think about turtle defenses. Mm -hmm. um, Hezbollah, think about what Hezbollah did in the second Lebanon war. Think about what, um, what's going on with the, Houth uh, the, the Houthis these days. Um, and uh, think of, so GRAM is guided rockets, artillery, mortars, and missiles. 
And so irregular forces, whether it's Hezbollah or uh, you know, what's going on with the, uh, the forces in Yemen and so on, uh, especially with precision, uh, you can do a lot, you, know, you can make people's lives miserable. And you know, what about that in Taiwan? What about that in the Philippines uh, with ground forces? And then if you're gonna conduct a counteroffensive, and this is something that um, Bob Work and I talked about, it's, it, it, the Marines don't have the, the capacity, I don't think, um, uh, that they would need to do it all on their own. You know, a forcible entry operation, say to take back Palawan and the, the Philippines. Or, so we have Rangers, we have uh, air assault, uh, we have airborne. Um, you know, what about at, at uh, Krepinevich's, you know, training center, um, you know, you set the task of, okay, we have the Chinese op four, they've got Chinese equipment, uh, they're gonna set up their A2 AD bubble. How do we go in and take it back? And you know, do we have the right force mix? You know, we have these various types of, of forces. Uh, what would work and what wouldn't? Um, you know, where would you do your prep fires? In, in World War II, we had battleships you know, off the coast of Iwo Jima. Uh, where would the fires come from today? Um, you know, incredible distances. Uh, you, you, you know, obviously, we saw that in Afghanistan right after 9-11. You know, we had uh, aircraft uh, flying off of carriers hitting a landlocked country. Mm -hmm. so, um, I think that uh, we're getting close to time, if I'm not mistaken, but can we, did, do we have enough time for maybe one, at least one from, uh, from online? David, please. Um, so we have a question from online about how one should go through the process of um, integrating or learning lessons from allies who have learned mm -hmm. them or not allies um, as well mm -hmm. without duplicating um, their process or reinventing the wheel. I'm not sure I understand that question. I think. Uh, well, I think uh, what, we, what we can learn from uh, from allies that are fighting or allies that are that, that are uh, uh, working on uh, operational concepts. Well, obviously, as well. say say the Ukrainians are are our allies. Right now, the Israelis. Uh, you could say both countries are de facto allies. Um, obviously, we would want to get any lessons learned um, because if if you look at uh, say the situation in Israel more and more of the world is becoming urbanized. And so, um, you know, there, there's a, and of course, uh, even in the Pacific in World War II, uh, the battle for Manila um, was, uh, was extremely costly, uh, both militarily in terms of human life and so on. Always good, it's good to learn from your allies, good to learn from your adversaries, good to learn from anyone that you think you know, has something to offer. Um, so I certainly wouldn't write off our allies. The, um, with me focusing primarily on the problem posed by China and the need to defend our allies along the first island chain, um, I certainly have uh, talked to the Australians and uh, they're doing some interesting work, more so the Japanese. So when, um, when archipelagic defense came out, about two weeks later, the Japanese invited me to go to Japan, went to Japan, and uh, went to uh, Okinawa, uh, went uh, to the Western Army headquarters, um, and briefed them on this stuff, uh, but they briefed me. Uh, it was General Boncho at the time, and he briefed me on the things they were doing, and they were ahead of us in areas like uh, coastal uh, artillery, for example, and uh, they were in, in the, uh, the midst of uh, basically transforming one of their army brigades uh, to do marine kind of work. Uh, they showed me videos of their exercises where they had anti-ship mines. They were dumping them in the water like Tic Tacs. I mean, you know, they were identifying the choke points and they were just flooding those areas with, with anti-ship mines. Well, that's a good idea. Um, so uh, in, in this version of archipelagic defense, it's, well, how do we lay that stuff down? If the Chinese get to go first, uh, we may have to do it with bombers, uh, which we can do. There have been some recent experiments uh, with mine laying using bombers, because uh, it may be too risky to get um, surface ships in there to do it. Uh, what you'd like to have, again, is army forces at critical choke points, you know, positioning this stuff. Um, the other th you know, so uh, certainly uh, a lot to learn from what the, the Japanese are doing. Uh, how are we on time? I think we're 
I think we're about done. Okay, so um, uh, Dr. Uh, Krepinevich, thank you so much for, for doing this event and uh, for, for being with us here. Thank you to all the, the, the people who joined us uh, online. And then a, a big thank you to uh, David Sturman and the whole crew here Absolutely. at uh, New America for doing such a, such a fantastic job, uh, as well as uh, Arizona State University's uh, Future Security Initiative, who's also a, uh, a sponsor of this event. Um, for those who are here, uh, there's a, a reception afterwards. Uh, for those who are at home, go pour a drink, um, and uh, the person will be able to talk to you. But the book is called The Origins of, of Victory. Uh, it's um, still available. I think it's available on Audible now. I don't know if it's available in paperback yet. I don't, I don't, I don't think yet, so. Not yet, but they, um, Yale called me the other day. They said they're coming out. The sales have been good enough that it's coming out in paperback sometime, I guess, around October. By the way, I brought three copies of Archipelagic Defense. I, I have to say archipelagic at least several times a day or forget how to say it. Uh, so if anybody is, is interested, uh, I just have three. Uh, so first come, first serve. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>